welcome our guest for the afternoon, um, Chaz Bundick, a.k.a. Toro y Moi. What's up? All right, so I want to jump right into it by, um, you know, your music's interesting and all that stuff, and we'll get to that. But I want to ask you about your hometown, because you're from Columbia, South Carolina. Yeah. Which, you know, kind of like Phoenix isn't necessarily known as like being like some cutting edge cultural right. center or anything like yeah. that. But obviously, you know, you've, you know, garnered global acclaim and stuff like that. But what was it like growing up in Columbia? Um, it's a small college town, so it's pretty dead in the summer. And uh, it's busy during the school years, so... I think, you know, a lot of us growing up, you know, the more artsy kids or whatever, the skaters, we would always hang out at, you know, whatever we could really find, skate parks or coffee shops or something, so it's not much to do, <laughs> house but shows and stuff or something. Your parents um, aren't from Colombia originally. No, yeah. Uh, my mom's from the Philippines. She moved here when she was 18, and then my dad's black, <laughs> and he lives, he's from Virginia. <laughs> did, they, did they meet in South Carolina? In South Carolina? No, they met in college, uh, actually in Maryland. And then what drew them to the wilds of Columbia? Family. Ah, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, you mentioned, you know, so you're of like a mixed, you know, racial background. Mm -hmm. Was that like an issue at all growing up in South Carolina? Like, you know, uh, I can't imagine there was a ton of like half black, half Filipino kids, yeah. you know, <laughs> that you could uh, intermingle with. So. Yeah, I mean, growing up, it was, uh, I guess, you know, being biracial, it can be confusing at times, especially when you're wondering what lunch table or something to sit at, you know. But that's about it. Like, I don't know. I just followed my interests. So you said you mostly fell in with, like, the skaters and, like, the art kids? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so at what point did, uh, were those also the kids, like, making music? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, our bassist, Patrick, you know, we went to high school together, so... Um, you know, we skated together, and uh, all, all, all the kids that sort of um, flocked together just ended up influencing each other and playing music because others were playing music or, you know, taking photography because others were taking photography or something, so, yeah. What point did you start playing music? I started, like, playing piano at eight. Uh, my mom was, like, pretty much forcing me to do that. And I really hated it. Uh, and then at 12, I told my mom I wanted to quit, but I wanted to play guitar on my own will. So she let me do that. Did it go over well? Was it like, did you have to like yeah. do some extra chores or something? Yeah, I told her I would play guitar. And she was like, OK. So. <laughs> <laughs> Only moderately disappointed. Yeah. So tell me about the heist and the accomplice. Is that a, that's another band that you? That, yeah, that was. Uh, the bassist, Patrick, that was our project back in high school and college. And then um, once Tori and Ma took off, that's when we decided to sort of focus, focus on this. So you started that band in high school, actually. Yeah, it was just for fun, really. Um, we didn't know about, you know, marketing or anything like that. Like, now it is just blogs, so. Um, so, and then when college came around, you mentioned that you went to the University of South Carolina. What made you decide to, to stay at home? Um, my first year of college, I went to Spartanburg, which was like an hour and a half away. And it, cause I was just, you know, tired of Columbia and I didn't really know much about it. But then the next year I moved back because I missed it so much. And, uh, there's so many, so much more at that school in Columbia, such as facilities that I could use, like the art program was really good. I had a really good photography program, darkroom and stuff, so. Um, you know, and it's cheaper to stay in state and. <laughs> did you live at home? I did. My, my freshman year I lived in the dorm, the sophomore year I moved back to my house. And then, um, yeah, I met Andy and Jordan and then we all started getting houses together and stuff. Was your mom still doing your laundry? That, no. <laughs> no, she, that was like, I had to do my own chores. That's good. So at some point along the line, uh, was this also when you first met Ernest Green? 
Yeah, uh, around my junior or senior year, maybe that summer or something. Yeah, we uh, met at a party and then we started talking about music. And could you tell everyone who that is, just in case they don't? Oh, uh, that's AKA Washed Out. <laughs> so at that point, were you already doing uh, music like Toro y Moi music? Yeah, I actually started Toro y Moi when I was in high school, my freshman year. Uh, I got like a four track. I read that you actually made up the name when you were like 15 years yeah. old. Yeah, I, I, you know, Patrick, the basses again, we had, we had an even earlier project, and I just needed, you know, a name for the stuff I was doing by myself at home. So if you started it, uh, you know, when you were, you know, 15, and then you had this other band, but why did it take, you know, so many years for, you know, releases to finally start appearing? And I, like, when did it become like a proper project? I think once, you know, the project started gaining momentum and press, uh, it's, you know, it just makes sense to follow that project. Um, you know, I want to do this for a living, so. <laughs> All right, well, tell you what, why don't we listen to, I mean, this is a track off the first uh, official album. I know you got you had some like unofficial releases before this, but the first record was called Causers of This, and I'm guessing this is probably the first song that a lot of people heard and how we were introduced. It was called Blessa, and uh, let's give it a listen a little bit. Thank you. So that was the first track off Causers of This, and I just want to ask you about like the process of of making that album because you know before you were you know in a band format with the heist and the accomplice and mm -hmm. this you pretty much made on your own yeah um i guess started in college when i got a laptop you know for school and i ended up getting fruity loops and then i moved on to you know like reason and uh you know i got more into sampling and electronic music and just i really uh for some reason, it clicked all of a sudden once I knew how to to create that style of music, create electronic music. I was drawn to all types of electronic music. So um, I guess that's what I was channeling through Causers was a lot of house and, um, you know, R&B, hip hop. Is that stuff that you grew up listening to? Not so much. Uh, I started listening to more R&B and hip hop once I got into high school and college. And what kind of, you know, what kind of hip hop and R&B? Um, anything from like, I don't even know, Michael Jackson to Tribe Called Quest and uh, not too much really. I mean, I listen to more now, but growing up, like I was really into like Weezer and the Pixies and stuff. I also, in my research, saw that you liked Blink-182 a lot. Yeah, when I was in high school. Do you try and keep that on the DL now? Am I totally not blowing really. up no, your I'm, spot? I'm not really ashamed of anything that I listen to. I, I like it all. I, you know, I, I like Justin Bieber and like Taylor Swift, too, just because my, my girlfriend listens to it a lot. So it reminds me of her. <laughs> um, at what point did you start hearing the word chill wave? And how did you feel about it? <laughs> Uh, you know, I heard it, you know, 2009, when I guess a lot of artists at the time were doing stuff out their bedroom, and they're also, you know, one guy projects and, you know, all the similarities. So I just thought, whatever, I don't know what they're talking about, but <laughs> yeah. So if you had to rank these terms from favorite to least favorite, <laughs> chill wave, glow fi, oh. and hypnagogic pop, <laughs> which one's the worst? Okay, that's a given. It's probably the last one you said. <laughs> the last one I don't even know how to say. Yeah. And I then mean, it would probably be chill wave, and then glow fi probably sounds the most, you know, pleasant to say. I mean, did you feel, when you started hearing people like lumping you in with these terms, did you feel like a need to like run away from it? Not at all, no. I, I'm, I'm constantly changing my music even before I was releasing stuff officially. Um, 
my friends know that I was, you know, doing electronic stuff and then going to do like an acoustic album, or, you know, this sort of like Elliot Smith esque or something. So I don't know. I I get bored easily, and so even when I was recording this album, I was playing or recording, you know, stuff that was for Underneath the Pine. And then once I had enough material and I felt comfortable, I, you know, grouped those together and released it. So at some point, I assume, you know, once Causers of This came out and got, like, a lot of positive attention, I'm sure you had to start playing a lot more shows. Yeah. And were you already playing uh, live as Toro y Moi before the, the album came out, really? Um, I played, like, maybe five shows before that as Toro y Moi. And, uh, yeah, I just started playing more once the tours were booked. And those initial shows, and even when you first started touring, was it just you? Yeah. And was it like weirdly nerve-wracking to go out like on stage? Were you going out with like a laptop and? Yeah, I mean that's the only thing I could think of doing that would uh, let people know what I was making. You know, I I couldn't go out and do that with a guitar or something. Uh, and some artists can. I mean, some artists pull off the one-man show really well, and it's amazing to see, and it's very strong and powerful. But I felt uncomfortable and what totally out of my element, so the band was the, the first step I wanted to do. Yeah, at how, how many shows, or at what point did you actually start bringing in other performers for the live show? Um, I, we started talking about touring together maybe like after the first tour I did in like August 2009, so we got ready for tour with Caribou. We were supporting them, and we were a three-piece, and then after that we were a four-piece. All right, I want to play another song from Causers of This, and then we'll, you know, we'll move on to like cool. a, a later spot in here. So this is uh, probably, I feel like this has become maybe the most popular track off the record. It's called, is it Talamac? Uh, the official pronunciation is Talamic. Talamic. <laughs> yeah. What is it a reference to? Uh, it's Tagalog for chronic or chronicle. All right, well, let's check it out. So when you were taking songs like that and then, you know, putting them into the context of a band, did you have to kind of like dissect the songs and then put them back together? Yeah. Um, I, you know, as you can tell, probably that song relies a lot on the production. So, you know, that the production is what gives it that mood. So really the only thing left to do in the live setting is to bring out the songwriting, which is what we did. And... I think it works well. There's there's only a few songs on the album um, that really can't be pulled off with a band just because it's it's cheesy or it doesn't work. When you're playing live, I mean, listening to that song, there's a lot of like sort of like weird like shuffly sounds where it almost sounds like you're like reversing it and stuff. And how do you translate that live? Because you can't like you know reverse your own voice necessarily. Right. Yeah. Um, there's only so much you can do. Um, you know, we have samplers on stage and effects pedals. And when our front of house guy, Pat, he's doing stuff too with his laptop up front. So, um, yeah, there's, it can't really be replicated, but uh, we try. <laughs> so do you no longer have a laptop on stage when you're performing? Uh, we do, but it's like sort of behind the scenes. It's not a you know, an instrument or anything. Yeah, it's not like you're just staring at your right, Mac yeah. the whole time. <laughs> so how did this affect, um, you know, the songwriting process, both, you know, playing with live with a band and also, like, touring, you know, I assume, a lot? Yeah, um, I guess when I made Underneath the Pine, I was really thinking about the live show. So I wanted to, you know, create an album that was going to, work really well live, and so uh, the best thing to do for that is to use live instruments, I felt. Um, I tracked the whole thing at my parents' house, actually, and uh, that was after I graduated, I think. Yeah. yeah, it was after I graduated, and I still didn't know what to do, so I took to the studio and mixed it. I saw that uh, in a previous interview where you said that 
halfway through the process of, or maybe it was after you had made it, you basically like scrapped half of Underneath the Pine yeah. and then went back and redid it. Uh, what prompted you to do that? I, you know, I really wasn't... The, I guess once you start to get, you know, noticed and I guess to a certain status, you start wondering about fans and gaining fans and stuff like that. And then the material that I recorded before that was very folky and anti-folky and just a mix of things that I've done before and that I was used to. So I thought that the best thing to do to bond, you know, my two different styles was to find some sort of segue or some genre that would work best. And I found that like funk and disco worked as that medium. All right, well, why don't we hear something off the final product and then we can talk more about the process of making the record. Um, this is called Still Sound and uh, this is from the second album, Underneath the Pine. Thank you. So writing a song like that, you were still all you pretty much in your bedroom, right? Yeah, I moved all my equipment to actually to my parents like piano room so yeah <laughs> but um so like it sounded a lot more like you know it sounds like a lot more full and real and that's because yeah. is everything on there or how much of that is like real instruments as opposed oh, it's 100 percent. i mean there's like a kick drum in the background that's looped over and over again but you know that's about it <laughs> When you were making Underneath the Pine, did you feel, I mean, you mentioned that you were thinking about, like, your fans and how you're perceived. Um, now that, you know, Tori Ma was, like, an established thing, did you feel a pressure making it that it, like, had to be, like, a real album yeah. now? Yeah, I mean, you start thinking about, you know, how long is this going to last, and then, you know, how big are you trying to get, and then you start thinking about all of these factors that start messing with your head and I don't know so and then you just have to trust your gut and just still try to remain you know adventurous and open-minded to everything but then again everything's on the other side trying to tell you to not change and stuff I don't know but it's, it's a weird fun process I mean, did you find it constructive then? Like, were you like, you know, checking the blogs and being like, oh, what are they saying about me? Yeah, doing like, market research? <laughs> no. Yeah. Or were you trying to like shut that? I mean, it sounds like you weren't necessarily shutting it all out. Right. I mean, like, you know, at the same time, you can't just be totally oblivious to what's going on in the music world. Um, you know, I always do that whenever I start making a new album, even I, I started working on the next album. And so... Every time I start, or when I say it's like, okay, this is it, I, I start an uh, iTunes playlist, you know, call it album three, and I have like MP3s of all sorts of stuff, um, from old 70s stuff to, you know, some of the, the newest production techniques that I like. So for Underneath the Pine, what would you say, you know, in terms of influences then and what you were like drawing from, how is it different than your previous, you know, releases? Did the, you in, uh, the influences. I mean like for causers I was really um into sampling and um incorporating the whole shoegaze element to that. And then you know, like I was saying, I was looking for that segue. So I pretty much was for the underneath the pine I was influenced by what I was sampling pretty much, which was soundtracks and uh, funk and R&B and disco. When you would, uh, you know, see yourself being compared, to, you know, and lumped in with other artists, like under the chill wave umbrella or whatever it was, I mean, I, you don't have to name names, but would you ever see other artists and be like, I don't sound anything like that guy? Of course, yeah. I mean, no one thinks that they sound like anyone, but, you know, people will find comparisons, I mean, find similarities. But then again, like washed out is someone that you were, you were friends with as well. Right. Yeah. I feel like and there's the, like a similarity there. I totally agree. Yeah. I mean, like we influenced each other and taught each other things before you know this this whole thing picked up. So I could totally understand that. And then, so after underneath the pine came out, 
pretty quickly thereafter, you put out another like substantial release, the Freaking Out EP. Yep. Uh, what prompted you to, you know, why don't we play something okay. off it, and then I want to ask you about it. So this is, uh, I think this is the first track, All Alone? Yeah. All right, this is the first track off the Freaking Out EP. So what prompted you to put out, you know, another like pretty substantial EP so quickly after after Underneath the Pine? Uh, the main reason was I wanted to play more upbeat songs live. So, yeah, I mean, on Underneath the Pine there's a handful of songs that, you know, are actually like danceable as opposed to just like a moderate tempo and then uh, I, it's that or it's instrumental. So, um... Yeah, we wanted to play, you know, more funky and upbeat and get people moving live. So, again, the live show influences how I'm writing. Um, it's just weird. <laughs> um, so, I mean, obviously, you know, there, you're pulling from a lot of, like, sort of, like, retro sounds on there. There's, you know, like, yeah. definitely disco elements, um, you know, a lot of, like, kind of, like, 80s boogie, R&B, yeah. funk kind of stuff going on. Even some, you know, Daft Punk kind of French house, you know, things going on. Mm -hmm. How do you, you know, revisit these sort of, like, retro styles without, you know, sounding derivative or, you know, just being, like, becoming, like, a nostalgia, you right. know, act? I, you know, I... Like, when I go back to my playlist for all the albums and stuff, I, there's, I even change the title on them and write down what I like about a certain track. Um, uh, sometimes the sample influences how the, you know, that song started with that Floor Tom Snap sample. So, like, the whole song was based off of that, and that sort of just took its way. And I think that's not even a disco song. That was like a, like a crowd song or something. Are most of your, you know, sample things, or even just if you're listening to records that you like, um, do you tend to pull from, like, really obscure sources, or do you listen to a lot of sort of, like, you know, more mainstream stuff from those eras as well? Yeah, I think the fun part about sampling is, you know, puzzling people and seeing if they can figure out what it is. So, you know, it's always fun to get the weirdest, most obscure samples even if it's just a four-on-the-floor beat. Do you ever get, like, uber fans being like, I know that snare sound is, you know, fill yeah, in I, the blank? <laughs> I, I think a couple of people called me out from causers. They, they were like, that's like a reason preset. I was like, yeah, so... <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but yeah, now I'm, you know, trying to avoid that, and uh, that's just the fun part. So were the songs on Freaking Out, were those written then after Underneath the Pine, or were they from, you know, similar, uh, like, same sessions, or...? No, yeah, that's all after Underneath the Pine. And you just, like, I mean, because I think Freaking Out came out, like, six months or something, not even yeah, after. I, I wrote it in February 2011, so that was, like, right when Underneath the Pine was coming out. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned, you know, that you wanted it to be, like, more dancey and upbeat, and you also have another project, like a side project, and is it Lessons? Is that how yeah, you say I, it? Yeah, I, I call it Lessons, just, but it's a play on words, so you can say it whichever way. Lessons. Well, well, I mean, you get to decide. Is, it's it's yeah. your project. Lessons is probably the most PC way to say it, but I had the word Lessons in mind. And uh, what prompted you to, you know, have a whole other side project? Um, I think that Having multiple names and projects is probably the most fun things you can ever do as a musician. And just, again, puzzle people. And the whole uh, fact that you can be anonymous is a fun thing. So that was one reason I wanted to do that again, or start another project. And another reason was that I didn't want people to think that Tori Moi was like a DJ or like just dance music. So. I uh, created a project that was just dance music. <laughs> well, why don't we hear um, one of the songs? I mean, there's only the one 12 inch. Is that the only official yeah, so far, release? Yeah. So this is the A side of a 12 inch that came out, and it's called Lena. Do you really like Daft Punk a lot? 
They're all right. <laughs> yeah, I love them. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's definitely a lot of that sort of like French touch, right. you know, French house sound in there. Um, and it, I mean, it reminds me a lot of like their Discovery album. Right, yeah. I was listening to that a lot at that time. Um, a lot of, that's when I was first discovered, you know, electronic and house music. So again, that's what was, was being channeled through that. <laughs> When you're making these songs, is this something that you've gone that you go back to your laptop and are doing, you know, all you know digitally, or is there organic elements in there as well? You know, that's like one of the first experiments I did, and so that's all on the computer. Um, you know, there's some MIDI stuff in there. I'm playing keys, but uh, I think now that I'm more comfortable and I, I feel like I'm more skilled and educated on you know, the rights and wrongs of certain things, whether it's like production techniques or even like songwriting stuff. Um, there's th things I'm willing to try. So, I mean, is there going to be more releases under this name, do you think? Or was I want to do one more. Off? It's fun. I, yeah, I, I want to start DJing and I want to start, you know, playing my tracks out and yeah. And have you actually, have you done any like, Proper club DJing or like beat matching. Yeah, I've done a like few, that. yeah. Um, on tour, there's you know after parties or something that we'll we'll DJ and sometimes it's just me, sometimes it's all of us and we do like a night out of it. But uh, I think um, that whole environment is like completely different, and that's what I love about having that side project. Yeah, I was gonna ask like, how big of a role would you say that like electronic music of this style, like you know more club oriented house, you know whatever, how big of a role does that play in your life? Is it something you follow obsessively, or is it just kind of a you know whatever it comes along? I've sort of become obsessed with it. Before I was just sort of into you know what people are talking about, but now I'm like, you know, checking the blogs all the time and even reading ones that aren't in English and stuff just to see what I can find. But yeah, I mean, it, I'm, I'm about as into it as I think I could be. Do you like, uh, you know, buy records or any of that stuff? Um, I don't buy vinyl, like house music or anything. I, or like singles. I, cause I'm not really DJing or I don't even have a setup. So, uh, I think the only vinyl I buy is maybe, or maybe, uh, reissues or something. What uh, scenes, or I mean, and this could be current or it could be, you know, from the past, like what uh, pockets of electronic music or dance music, if you want to call it, would you say are like most interesting to you? Um, probably Deep House and French House. Um, I think a lot of the new stuff I've been playing with space. And so uh, just sort of trying to mimic those elements of space in, that I hear in like Deep House. So then when you go back, you know, because you're still doing Toro y Moi the whole time, and that's like a band and it's pretty much all instruments, do you ever go back to that setup and be like, oh, this is boring. I don't want to make a pop song. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's when I'll go and do something else, like just play with my loop pedal or something. And, or sometimes I don't even mess with music. If, if you're not feeling, you know, creative in that feel, just go away from it. I'll go, you know, mess with my photos or something in Photoshop or, you know, start working on a design for something. Um, yeah, for a while, you know, I think for underneath the pine, like when I threw away all that old, the first material I had, there's like a couple of weeks in between where I just didn't do anything and I tried to go back out and socialize. But when I got back in the groove, I didn't even talk to anyone really or go out. I, I, I don't really go out when I'm working on music, like when I'm, when I'm in a, the album mode, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, it seems like when you started at, you know, Tori Moi and like even when the first album came out and stuff, you seem to mention that like it just kind of happened and then all of a sudden you were playing all these shows and stuff. Yeah. But at this point, do you think of yourself as like, I'm a musician. This is this is what I do. This is my career. Yeah, I I'm making a living off of it and it's really awesome and I like I'm really thankful for it. So, it's really cool. It's happening. 
I want to ask you about like the realities of being, you know, a quote, you know, indie artist in yeah. 2012. Because like as far as like that scene goes, I mean, you're the kind of artist, you know, you get written up, you know, anything you do, you know, like it's a news on Pitchfork. Right. Or, you know, you're doing tours like all over the world really is. But I imagine like you're probably, you know, you're not going to sell a million records right, yeah. or anything like that. So is it like really like financially sustainable to be, you know, an indie act in, in 2012? It can be. Um, when I first started playing shows, I was solo for the first two tours. Um, and that was, you know, that's when you can be on the road for a month making $100 a night. And this guy knows, he, he brought me from, you know, since 2009 to Phoenix and now here we are. So like, you know, when I was solo, I was playing for 100 bucks a night. I was paying for gas and I was just driving by myself in my Ford Focus and uh, you know, I would invite friends along to help me drive just because it, it can get ridiculously tiring. Uh, and then when we got to that move where we're getting paid more, it, coincidentally, I was ready to make that move to have a band. So we've been fortunate, fortunate enough to have really awesome timing. So how much touring is involved in your, in your life like these days? I'd say maybe eight months seven months out of the year it's pretty rough do you i mean do you enjoy it or is it just like something you've got to do it's yeah it's something you got to do you know you don't want to go back to working at the bagel shop or anything like that that's what i was doing um you have to make ends meet and you have to pay the bills and so touring is fun and not fun because you get to see the world and you get to see all these amazing exotic places but you're only there for maybe 10 hours i think the first time we were in italy we were there for eight hours i mean it's it's bittersweet but you do get to see where you want to go back to so so now when you go and talk to your mom about your music is she okay with you not playing piano anymore <laughs> well yeah she says i'm playing piano but like with your parents i'm curious like are they like oh you know this is our son he's a musician or are they still waiting for you to like get no, a no. real job they they are very into my mom has me on her Google reader so she like tells me every time I'm on Pitchfork or something I'm like yeah I know I saw it too so um, is she getting on like message boards like when there's a bad review and like uh, I think the first time I told her I was on Pitchfork she didn't really know but she was super excited that I was in the Columbia Free Time Weekly <laughs> so I can still see that. Um, you know, that jump that of what older people know about uh, the biggest, the big media circuits, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, I wa also want to ask you about, you know, when you started making music as Tori Moi, it was pretty much, you know, just you in your bedroom and stuff like that. But as it gets bigger and it progresses, like, how has your, you know, your process evolved in terms of, like, your gear that you're using, like, are you using, like, a, an elaborate setup? Are you recording in real studios now? Like, right. how much is it, like, a real, you know, quote, band, you know? Uh, we practice just like any other band, and it sucks sometimes because you have to play it, you know, 20 times in a day when you're learning a new song. Um, sometimes you have off days and everyone's messing up on stage or you're having power issues. But then again, it's a, you know, Everyone's playing an important role, so it's very much a band. But you're still writing all of the, the material, yes? Yeah. So do you think at some point, like, you might, you know, invite other people into the songwriting process? Oh, or? totally. Yeah, I think, you know, eventually, even maybe this album, it's like, it makes sense to do that. Um, I think it worked so well for a band, you know, Cloud Nothings. He did his first Full out, full band album, and it sounds amazing. And it's it, his sound totally changed, but I, I felt like it was for the best. So you never know what is going to help. How do you walk that line where it's like your project, but there's a band, and it's like because you know you're technically the boss and kind of have to like you know right, steer yeah. the ship, so to speak. Big but boss. I assume these guys are like your friends. Yeah, and we've been childhood friends, so it's so weird. Do you have to like ever like be like? Hey, that bass line sucks. <laughs> no. Um, I might say, I mean, 
my my band they're all talented guys so you know they can pick up on it right away i might have to tell them you know maybe turn down the distortion a little bit or maybe use eighth notes or something but you know when you're um it's not a democracy or anything so <laughs> or or it's not a oh, wait, the other I'm, one i'm not the king that one freudian slip yeah <laughs> whoops <laughs> sorry y'all no, but I'm curious about that. Like, how much of stuff is up for, like, a vote, so it, to speak? It's like, you know, the band votes on it. If, if, you know, Patrick's using too much fuzz bass or Jordan's using a little bit too much wah pedal, <laughs> we might be like, yo, chill out. <laughs> chill out with that. <laughs> There's been times where, you know, we, we'll, like, you know, we'll have to take a break because we're arguing so much over something. But it's all in... It's all for the best, so you know. So you don't get like veto power just because it's like your I do. Band. I, I'm like if I like I'm just like no, I don't want to play that song today. Then that's fortunately that could be my call because <laughs> I have to sing it and I don't want to sing it today or something. But I, you know, it's uh, I try to make everything equal. I'm not. You just seem like a freak. total tyrant, like a total power <laughs> maniac. <laughs> yeah, I, it's. A weird situation. <laughs> <laughs> so what is, uh, you know, what are you guys doing right now? Like, is there another album in the works or? Yeah, there is. Um, this is actually the first album where I'm going to just take my time and not have to set a deadline and write in between now and that deadline. So um, I've been going to the studio already and I'm doing it in the studio, of course. And so... It's a new environment to be there. I, I don't know exactly what I'm into yet. Um, so, yeah, it's coming along. Where do you see it going, like, stylistically? Do you, wanna, do you think it's going to continue sort of on the dancier vibe of freaking out? or? I've, you know, I've always wanted to keep previous or keep um, people that are already fans interested in what I'm going to do next. So it's going to be very, I think if you like the first two albums, you're going to like this one. So, um, but then again, it's going to, I'm always trying to gain new ears as well. Okay, cool. Well, I think, why don't we open it up to the audience and see if anyone out here has any questions for Chaz. So if, I guess you can just, you know, raise your hand or... What's up, man? How you doing? All right. <laughs> Um, I have a question. Um, how important is side chaining in your music when, when you're using electronic stuff? Uh, I wouldn't say very important. That's you know something that I messed around with for the first album, and then I wanted to just leave it alone. F I don't know for how long, but it's not important at all to me. I think that um, I don't know. It's just that was just mainly an experiment. For causers. Yeah, for the for, for that first one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Hey, what's up, man? What's up, dude? Hey, um, I was curious. Um, are you a big fan of psychedelic music? I hear yeah. a lot of that, and, and <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, and totally. all of the music like across the board. And and I was also wondering, um, like, what blogs do you like and um, to check out music and stuff? Um, I wish I had my computer with me on stage. I I like. Uh, you know, I've really been looking at like a lot of YouTube channels, really, because um, a lot of the blogs you can't even download them anymore, just because people people are scared of posting MP3s. So um, there's a lot of YouTube channels that I can't even pronounce because people just make up weird screen names. But Bleep is good for electronic music. I I, I don't really know too many. Um, psychedelic blogs or anything though. Uh, psychedelic heroin is one I would recommend. What was that? Psychedelic heroin is one that I okay. would recommend. Yeah. Uh, cool. Captaincrawl.com is awesome too. Captain Crawl. Thanks. How you doing? How's it uh, going? So my question is related to when you started performing by yourself, just with a laptop. Right. Like how much? Like because you're singing the songs, right? Uh -huh. Would you primarily focus on those songs that you were singing and? Would you only be singing, or like how much would you extract from the instrumental uh, right. to perform? I would take out all the keys, and I was playing the keys live and just singing on top. Um, 
I think that was the only thing I felt like was working. I wasn't really into dancing or like interacting with the crowd or anything until recently, so. <laughs> well, I want to ask you, actually, that brings a point where how important are, you know, lyrics in your music? Because you mentioned that, you know, you're getting more into like dance stuff and that's, right. you know, a world where like lyrics and words don't necessarily matter, but your songs are also very pop and like the vocals are in the forefront, so. Right. Um, lately, I've been trying to focus more on lyrics just because they are coming more towards the front and I don't want them to be so mundane. I don't know. I feel like a lot of the records from, a lot of the lyrics from the first records, they, I wasn't trying to write like poetic or anything. I was just sort of just writing and not trying to avoid reiteration or anything like that. So, and then I think people ended up liking it the way it was. So, I don't know. I try not to change my t technique too much because it works. Are your lyrics, you know, usually pretty literal? Are your songs like about certain people and certain things? Right, yeah, I like that. I have, you know, a lot of songs that are like that, but then I, I enjoy songs that are just straight up weird and you don't know what they're talking about or they're about some sort of character, you know? Um, I, I really like Frank Ocean's song, Novocaine, and how he talks about just meeting this girl at Coachella and just doing drugs. And I thought it was a really cool concept and I've never like thought about lyrics like that, so. That's one of the inspirations, or one of the songs on my playlist for this album. Anyone else in the audience? There we go. So uh, what's on that iTunes playlist for uh, <laughs> the new album? What's in there? Um, it, you know, it's weird because stuff, the thing, like I have like some uh, like movie soundtrack stuff, but you know, I'm focusing more on the chords that they use and not really the production. I feel like a lot of the you know '70s stuff that was in the play playlist for underneath the pine was more for the production, but this is more for the songwriting. Um, so like that, and there's some Kanye West in there. <laughs> um, I really like uh, "Watch the Throne." I thought that that was really uh, really pushing you know mainstream hip hop boundaries. When you're in album mode, do you find yourself listening randomly to music differently? So you, or does it just pop in your head? This yeah. would be good for the. Yeah. Um, I, again, I guess I just listen to it for different elements. Like I'll, I'll have, um, you know, like a Flying Lotus song in there for like texture, just because I like the way he was using his space. The way he would sometimes doesn't have any space, and everything is, you know, just. Uh, sewn together. Um, so th I, again, I guess I just listen for different things about different songs, from different songs. What kind of stuff are you listening to when it's like, you know, not listening for chords or listening for instruments? <laughs> like when you're just like, I want to listen to something that I like. It's probably going to be the newest song I just wrote. <laughs> I'm like, I don't, I'm sure like other producers out there do this too, the songwriters. You're probably constantly listening to your stuff. If not, I guess that's, that's fine, but I'm constantly critiquing myself and seeing what needs to change and what I would want to do. Um, seriously, like, I've, given, I've woken up with headaches just because I've been listening to my headphones way too loud and just listening to, like, the newest song that I've made or something. Um, it's been a while since I've, like, just listened to someone else's music. Um, and just sort of just soaked it in because of the mood it put me in. So does that mean like from the time you first record a song to when it goes on the album, does your average song go through like 74 different versions? Yeah, I'm, by the time the album comes out, I'm probably tired of the song. <laughs> That's why I'm writing, writing a new song already or a new album already. But uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, getting to this position to where it's your job, you sort of look at music and hear music differently. And uh, I used to listen to my music, and it's probably bad, but I used to listen to my music to sort of, you know, put me in that mood. And now I feel like that's sort of going away. And it's more just like, you know, checking my homework sort of now. 
Are you still enjoying it? Oh, I love it. Yeah. I mean, that's why, I mean, it's, it's like bittersweet. I love doing it and I like, uh, making new songs all the time. I'm always collaborating with people and, um, just making like little MP3s and just showing them to, you know, friends only and stuff. So yeah, it's definitely a passion and that's, I want to make sure this is, I don't get jaded doing this. So if, you know. I'm ever feeling like this is just becoming work or if something is forced, I'm going to go back to doing something else. Bagel shop. Will they take no. you back? <laughs> Hopefully, like, some design thing. I don't know. <laughs> uh, is there another question in the audience? Yeah. Hey, how are you doing? What's going on? Um, so for, your, like, your writing process, how much do you rely on, like, music theory and, uh, like, standard chordal progressions and stuff? Uh, I try to... Um, you know, I was like, I guess I was classically trained when I was eight up until like 12. So I forgot already how to sight read. Like if you show me something, I'll t- t- have to like figure out for 20 minutes. But, you know, I, I like to understand. I like my songs. Let me start over. I understand all of the music theory. And I like to incorporate that when, when it comes to like having dynamics and knowing when, you know, you want to go to cut time or something. So I, I try to, that's just sort of become, you know, I guess part of the production as well. I find, you know, the songwriter is now the producer as well. So it's sort of a blurry line now. Is your production, I mean, I assume like a lot of your production techniques are self-taught mm-hmm. as well. Like, um, how, are you still kind of just like piecemealing it together? Like how to use programs and, and stuff like that? Yeah, um, being in the studio now, too, working on this, I never really mess with Pro Tools, so I'm learning my way around, my way around that, and um, I'm, I've always been a fan of hardware, so just, you know, the feel of knobs and actually hearing what you're changing is very gratifying, and yeah, I'm constantly learning new stuff, staying up late on YouTube, watching videos on pedals and I don't know. Does anyone else in the audience have any questions? There we go. I'd like to ask you two questions. Okay. Um, first, are you an only child? No, I have a brother. A brother? Is yeah, he he's, older? Uh, he's 19. Okay, younger. Um, and who is your favorite Beatle? My favorite Beatle? If you could compare yourself, if you wanted to choose a Beatle to like, sort of model your career after or not model okay. your career after. I like George. George is cool. Sweet. Why? Why? Because George was the one that changed the Beatles, I feel like. He's, he brought in he brought in the Harry Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Paul is my favorite songwriter. Anyone else in the audience have any questions? All right. Well, then, awesome. why don't we, uh, of course, Chaz is going to be performing with the full band later tonight right here so everyone can come back. But let's thank him for coming out and sitting on the couch. Thank you. Toro y moi. Thank you. Peace out.